I'm Ralph Hansen. I'm chair of our Austin Board of Advisors for our chapter, uh, the Texas Tri-Cities Chapter of NACD. We want to thank you for being with us today. We have two nationally recognized leaders from the startup world to talk to us about building and leading startup company boards. Austin's own Josh Bayer will interview Matt Bloomberg on this tremendous book, Startup CEO, that Matt has written. In fact, this book is so good that the Kauffman Fellows Academy has turned it into an online course, which is a massive undertaking and a real tribute to, to what Matt has produced, the quality of this work. There are six chapters in this book on building and leading a startup company board, and Josh is going to focus on those six chapters and walk through with Matt building and leading a startup company board. Josh Bayer uh, describes himself as someone who helps people quit their day jobs and become entrepreneurs. And that's certainly true, but he's a whole lot more. He's a successful serial entrepreneur. He's the world's most active investor in email startups. And he's co-founder and executive director of the Capital Factory. Uh, and by the way, Matt suggested I mention to you that everybody in the room here today could be a mentor at the Capital Factory. So I'll let you think about that. And Matt was, uh, jo Josh was quoted in the paper today about a startup crawl uh, that, that they are sponsoring tonight where you can go out and see what 50 startups in Austin are up to. So just a little food for thought for you. So the Capital Factory and Josh are twin sources of pride for Austin. When leaders come from other parts of the country or the world, they want to see the Capital Factory and they want to talk to Josh. That's just the way it is. He was 2013 Austin Community Leader of the Year. And he's going to interview his friend and colleague, Matt Bloomberg, who in addition to this book, has a blog called Only Once. And it is really terrific. If you're here from the startup world, you probably know about it. If you don't, you ought to go home and bookmark it. It's really great. Um, and, and Matt is able to produce a book like Startup CEO and a blog like Only Once because he's walked the walk. He is chairman and CEO of Return Path, which he founded in 1999. He's built it uh, to, to be the leading company in the email intelligence space. He's got over 400 employees. And it's routinely voted as one of the best places to work. So I think you'll see as Josh interviews Matt that we're going to get the benefit of his values and his accomplishments and experience, and it ought to be fun. With that, let me turn it over to Josh. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, great. So again, I'm Josh Baer, and I'm really excited to be here with, with Matt, a good friend of mine uh, and colleague who I've worked with for more than a decade. Uh, we're going to talk about Startup CEO, a field guide to scaling your business, which is really a comprehensive manual for a startup CEO, uh, and is part of Brad Feld's larger series of books called the Startup Revolution series. And so they have all these different books around different aspects of uh, being involved in startups, founding startups, running startups, living in a startup, uh, and things like that. Um, and in fact, there's another book coming out um, called Startup Boards which is all about just startup boards as well. So Matt covers quite a bit of it in his book, but there's a whole other book coming out just on that topic. So I've known Matt for more than a decade. We've worked together on multiple businesses. My first business that I started, uh, Skylist, we were partners way back then um, when we helped uh, build products together. Um, and he's somebody that I respect and look up to quite a, uh, greatly. Um, and there's probably no better sign of that than that I just, we actually, I sold my last company to Matt. Um, and so, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was, that was obviously, a, you know, a, a testament of feeling like it was a pretty, pretty incredible team that I wanted to join, that, uh, that it was an executive team I was excited to be part of and to be, to be, have, be interact with uh, an incredible board that they have, uh, as well as uh, a really great place for my team to go. As, as was already mentioned, it was, it's frequently rated one of the best places to work uh, in the country. And, um, and I felt really good about having this be a place that my team could, could grow and could flourish. Um, so we're going to talk about the book today, which like I said covers a pretty broad range. We're going to focus on the more board-oriented aspects of it. But um, to start off with, you know, at the beginning of the book, the first chapter is really all about telling your story and all the different ways when you're starting a company, you have to be able to tell your story. You have to tell your story to potential employees you're trying to recruit and hire. You have to tell your story to investors, to customers, to maybe a board member you're trying to recruit. So Matt, can you tell us the return path story? What, what is return path? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, everyone hear me OK? Great. So Return Path, we describe ourselves as the uh, worldwide leader in email intelligence. Uh, and we're in the uh, internet marketing services space, uh, generally focused on email. And our story, uh, very simply, is that email is a very different digital communication channel than any other digital communication channel, web, mobile, or social. And the thing that uh, really separates it from uh, the rest of the internet 
uh, besides some technical things, is that it's a push channel. So companies send out email to communicate with their customers, where all the other channels are website, mobile, social. Customers are coming to them to interact with them on their website or on their app. And that critical difference means that uh, there is a real lack of data and analytics around the email channel uh, relative to other channels. So you know, if you think about it, if you were the person in charge of running your company's website, you'd have the luxury of customers on your website all the time. So the behavior and, uh, uh, and engagement data is available to you. And if you're the person running your company's email program, you push a button and send out a million emails, and all the data uh, around behavior and engagement does not happen on your server. It happens on their uh, desktops or uh, in Hotmail or Yahoo or Gmail. So return pass business is, uh, with that as, a, as an underlying premise, our business is to collect all of that data from mailbox providers, from filters, from end users, and aggregate it and apply analytics to it uh, and then enable our clients who are big email marketers like Amazon or eBay or Facebook uh, to have access to that data for the email channel the same way they would have it for the web channel or the mobile channel. So that's, that's our business. And uh, how big of a business is it? Um, we're closing in on 100 million in revenue now. Uh, we have about 400 employees. We're in uh, 13 uh, locations, seven countries around the world. We have about two dozen people here in downtown Austin. Uh, very, uh, uh, very exciting. Uh, office, part of Capital Factory right now uh, as well. And um, that's sort of the size and scope. Great. So, you know, as I did this, uh, I re read the book, and uh, actually I listened to the audio version of the book, which is a little bit new to me, but I've, I've really enjoyed it. So I've been doing it on the way back and forth to work uh, every day uh, on, uh, on Southwest Parkway. And, um, and so what was really interesting is, is uh, and I'm sure this is very common, but Matt is not the one who or, or read the book on the audio recording. So and I know Matt very, very well. So I'm listening to this book, and I'm hearing all these words, and I know these words, but it's not Matt. And so then now, and I haven't seen Matt for a couple months, and then seeing him here, it's almost kind of disconcerting, and I'm expecting the other voice to come out of his, <laughs> out of his mouth. Um, but, um, but, you know, it's, it's funny as I read this because everything is so familiar, and I feel like um, not... It, it's, not in, it's not in a way that, oh, that's obvious, but in a way that, oh, I already know that. As I, as I go through the book, so much of it is ingrained in, into me already. And I was at Return Path for about two years, which is, I would consider a really long period of time, although I was familiar with the company for longer. And yet, and, and I never, I, mean, I don't know if I would get in trouble for this. I never read any employee manuals. I didn't like, you know, I didn't, I didn't do any formal indoctrination, yet all this stuff is already in my head. And I thought that was really a great testament to the, the way that Return Path runs, is that you can't help as part of the company but to absorb these best practices and rhythms and as, as, as Matt and the company calls it, the operating system of the company. And many parts through the book, Matt talks about the operating system for the company, for the board, for himself personally. Um, so, uh, and, and one of the things I love about that is the book's very practical. Anytime I give a talk or I write something, I always want somebody to walk away with something they're going to do differently, something that they can actually, okay, I'm going to use that, I'm going to take that back. And this book is just full of those things, and a lot of that fits into this idea of the operating system. So Matt, can you tell us a little bit about one, you know, why is that so important, and how do you make that something that's ingrained into the company of everybody? So they don't have to read the manual to figure out how it works, but it's almost like osmosis. You just pick it up from everyone around you. And then in particular, what's a board's operating system look like? Yeah, you know, the, the concept of the operating system, right, if you think about hardware land, right, the operating system is what connects the hardware to the software and makes sure the software runs smoothly. And, uh, and that concept applies, I think, to companies and to individuals as well. So our operating system at Return Path is the thing that connects, uh, you know, essentially the, the humans in the business to the agenda of the business and make sure that the agenda runs smoothly. And, uh, you know, over the years we've uh, really kind of refined this uh, to uh, a place where every stakeholder in the business, which for a private company, um, obviously, uh, investors and directors have a lot more overlap than a public company necessarily. Um, but uh, where the, the board and uh, employees know what to expect and have kind of a regular rhythm and cadence to communication, uh, to information flow um, about the business. And that, you know, that sort of, um, that drumbeat, that cadence is uh, something that I think helps everyone anchor their activities around planning, setting goals, executing, and reviewing. So for us, 
uh, we've always run uh, what I think of as a very integrated organization between the board and uh, the, the team. Um, I know there are a lot of CEOs who don't do that, who sort of like to keep the two separate and think of themselves as the, as the choke point between the two. Um, but uh, we've always found that there's a lot more leverage in unifying the two. So when I think about sort of what our operating system is or what the cadence is of our, um, of our annual activities, uh, it actually starts with uh, board meetings and we kind of work out from there. So uh, that doesn't mean that we're a board-dominated company. Actually, what it means is that board meetings are harder to schedule than anything else. <laughs> so uh, you know, every year in August or September, we plan out the following year's calendar of our four quarterly board meetings. Uh, and we work backwards from there. So um, around a board meeting is obviously a whole bunch of reporting and putting together materials for the board. Uh, we've always been a really transparent organization internally to our team. Uh, there are no state secrets. Uh, really, the only th things that are not talked about broadly in the organization would be uh, individuals' compensation. Uh, but anything in terms of financial results, operating results, um, and even uh, you know, sort of the questions that are on my mind or on the executive team's mind, um, things that aren't going well, things that are going well, all of that uh, we pull together into uh, a packet that goes to the board. Uh, but there are a bunch of activities around that. So I typically hold my staff's quarterly offsite maybe three weeks before a board meeting. So we have an opportunity to pull up, assess how things are going, look at the metrics, figure out how we want to use our time with the board, and start producing those materials. Um, then following the board meeting, we distribute the board materials to the whole company. Um, we go through them, we redact a couple things from them, but we don't redact very much. Um, and then that becomes the basis for a whole series of communications internally around how the business is going. So we'll send out the materials, we'll have an all-hands meeting, uh, we'll have team roundtables uh, where the, the leaders of the business get to connect with uh, individuals. Um, you know, we tie into that uh, refreshes to the plan, refreshes to the product plan. Um, so everything is kind of anchored around uh, the uh, you know sort of the end of the quarter, the review of results, and doing it in a very integrated way between the board and the team. So, uh, and what about the operating system for the board itself? Is there anything different about that? Um, you know, I, I think we have a uh, we have a very good formula that we've developed over the years with the board. Um, we uh, we have a board that's very geographically distributed, like our company is. We have some in New York, uh, some in California, um, and uh, some in Colorado. We meet four times a year. Um, I'm very insistent that people come in person. Um, I would say each director might have one a year where they end up calling in, but the intent is that everyone comes in person. Uh, we uh, always have social time in addition to meeting time. Uh, so usually dinner the night before, dinner after the meeting, uh, which is just for directors only. Uh, we have uh, set a very clear expectation with our board that uh, they will uh, get materials for the meeting uh, with uh, a few days to spare. And uh, usually we send them out on a Friday so the board has a weekend and then whatever number of weekdays before the meeting to review materials. We have a commitment that materials are going to look the same each time, so uh, they sort of understand where to look for what and how to navigate them. Uh, and um, you know, I think, again, we try to run the board the same way we run the organization. There's a real commitment to uh, openness and transparency. Most of my executive team uh, joins uh, the full board meeting other than executive session. Um, and we have a very specific way that we run board meetings, which we'll probably talk about in a little bit. Uh, and, um, and we also have a very specific process for board feedback, um, which we run um, not quite every year, probably every 18 to 24 months. So, um, so there is a very methodical uh, system that we have to managing the board as well. So I've been, personally, uh, I'm, I sit on a small number of boards of small companies, uh, and I've been able to sit in as an observer on many other boards, uh, including return paths as part of the executive team. And, um, and I can say that the return path board, at least in my limited perspective of, say, 10 boards, is clearly both one of the most highest caliber in terms of the resumes of the board members and the impressiveness of that, as well as the actual effectiveness and way that it operates compared to, uh, again, my, my, my limited experience. And so uh, the, you know, Matt's board is, from, the start, from a startup world perspective, is just like the A-list of the top people that, that 
uh, most people would want to be their first investors or to be able to go ask for advice or make introductions. He's got Brad Feld, who's also one of the authors of this uh, book series. Brad is a famous uh, both entrepreneur and investor. He helped found Techstars, which is an international program for helping launch startups. I mean, he's very well known through that and is a blogger. Uh, Fred Wilson is another one of the board members. He's a very, all, probably one of the most prominent VC bloggers uh, and based out of New York. One of the first investors in Twitter and a lot of other great companies. Um, and then one of the first product managers from Netscape and one of the first people that built Hotmail and uh, is now a partner in Dreesen Horowitz and just this incredible list of people. So Matt, how do you end up with this Dream Team board? I mean, this is the board everybody would want to have. How does that come about? Um, well, it, first of all, it comes about intentionally, not accidentally. And um, we've worked really hard at that since the beginning of the company. And um, yeah, I would say with, with respect to the venture investors, um, you know, I always advise startup CEOs to not just go after the best firms and not just go try to raise money, but to really focus on who the partner is at the venture firm that's going to be on the board. Because um, everyone's money at the end of the day is, is money, but uh, the person who's on your board is the person that you're really going to be spending time with, getting advice from. You want to make sure that uh, you interview them from that perspective as well. But one of the things that we've done, um, which is very, uh, actually, much more um, aligned with how public company boards work, is we've always had multiple independent directors on our board. So it can be typical for venture companies to just have management and VC and no one else. And uh, from day one, we've always had um, at least one and usually two or three independent directors on the board. Uh, and uh, what I've found uh, for uh, recruiting those uh, directors is that, first of all, Startups don't always have them, so they're not in quite as much demand for private company uh, boards as, uh, as you might think. Um, but I also find that the process of recruiting them is just a great calling card for CEOs. You know, most, most people who you would think of as being qualified to sit on a private company board um, are kind of happy to take a meeting or a call with someone who's a sitting CEO of, uh, uh, of a company that maybe they've heard of or maybe they know someone who's connected to. Uh, but we've focused on recruiting directors uh, the same way we focus on recruiting executives. You know, it takes a long time. We have to have a, a pipeline of them. Uh, we uh, have a job description. We have, you know, certain characteristics we look for. And um, so we've just worked very, very deliberately at it, but really appreciate the role that independent directors play, um, even in a private company board. Um, so let's talk about the board book. You, you mentioned it briefly and talked about how much time and effort goes into that. How, how big is the board book? Um, you know, it, it ranges. I think we've had I ones. Have we have we have ones as small as forty or forty-five pages, and as big as a hundred pages. It kind of depends what's in them. Um, you know, for for us, the um, you know, as I talked about our operating system, our objective is to um, to do one set of reporting that works for the board and for the team, um, not to sort of create something that's special for the board that has no other utility. So we like to think the things that are important to us about running the business should also be important to the board. Um, and uh, the, the materials that we send out are kind of the opposite of the meeting or the inverse of the meeting. So the materials we send out are probably 75% uh, backward looking and 25% forward looking. And we like to run the meeting the other way around where we spend a little bit of time looking back and more time looking forward. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, we send out uh, a packet that has a few characteristics to it. One is it's consistently formatted each time so the directors know what to expect, right? It, you know, think about it from the perspective of reading a magazine, right? If you read The, the Economist every week, you know what to expect. You know what the columns are called. You know what order they come in. Um, it would be very confusing to you if you picked up The Economist every week and everything was jumbled around and looked different and had different fonts and formats. So uh, it seems like a small thing, but for people who come in and out of a company four times a year for two days, uh, that's actually quite helpful. You know, similarly, we have a commitment to put together a single document uh, for a board meeting. So I've been on boards before where I get the board materials, and it's an email with 12 attachments. And it says, oh, you know, you've got to look at this thing for that, and the budget's over here, and um, you know, we make it easy. We put it all in a PDF. We number the pages. Uh, it's all in order, and it tells, uh, tells a story. Um, and then, you know, as I said, the, the reporting piece of it may be a lot of volume because there's a lot to report on. But I think the most um, interesting and kind of the most impactful parts of the board book are the final 10 or so pages of it, which is a, a section that we called On My Mind. And that is literally uh, the two to five issues that are on my 
mind or on the executive team's mind. Sometimes it's talking about something that went well. Sometimes it's talking about something that didn't go well. More often than not, it's talking about a forward-looking strategic question, something that we're thinking about and we'd like to get the board's um, engagement around and strategic advice around. Um, and those, those are short, you know, sort of two or three page prose documents. And that's really what governs most of the conversation at the meeting itself. So you mentioned that it, you only want to produce one set of books and that it's shared uh, pretty broadly with the executive team and others, and I think you mentioned the company. Um, and as much as, as you know, for me, I am all a fan of efficiency and fewer reports, um, I'm sure that there's more to why that book gets shared with everybody other than we just didn't want to make a separate <laughs> copy for them. So can you talk a little bit more about why it's so important that the board book is shared with the rest of the company and how the, the company reacts to that? Yeah, our, our philosophy in managing our team uh, is very much uh, one of trust and empowerment. And uh, you know, for, for companies like ours that are 100% uh, you know, knowledge workers and creative workers, uh, really smart people at every level in the organization, uh, we have uh, a, a tremendous faith that um, if everyone in the company knows the mission and knows the plan and knows where we're going, and if they get regular uh, bursts of information about how we're doing along the way, um, that they'll be able to make good decisions on their own about where to spend their time uh, and, uh, uh, and how quickly things need to get done. So our whole philosophy of management is around providing as much information as we can to the very smart people who work in our organization about how things are going. Um, so that's, that's fundamentally why we share all the information. In terms of how it's received, you know, it's interesting. I like to think uh, that uh, everyone reads all, all 100 pages. Um, and I know that's not true. But what I do know is that most people, um, and uh, you know, probably not all, but almost all people in the company um, open the attachment when they get it from me. Um, I would guess that most of them skip straight to the back and read the on my mind stuff, because that's kind of the juicy part where I'm talking about things that might not be going well or what I'm thinking about in the future. They probably all look at the summary of the operating dashboard and the financials. Um, we try to make it easy for them as well. I usually send out uh, a link to about a 30 minute webcast where they can actually watch me scrolling through the book with my mouse highlighting things for them to pay attention to. So um, I'd guess you know, most of the people, most of the time, absorb the information they need. Yeah. So also if that's not true, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> It's funny, within my own team, you would see there were, you know, most, most people that kind of, you know, like Matt said, you know, skimmed through it. Obviously, they probably didn't get too caught up in the P&L or the other parts, but then, you know, read the, the summary and have some questions. And there's <laughs> one person on my team that reads every single page and has a list of questions. And it is, you know, it's, it's not always the person you would expect to, you know, to necessarily be the most, uh, uh, most focused on those things. But it's, it's always interesting to see what comes out of that. And we, we know we'll always get a certain We know, number we know of where it's coming from, yeah. yeah. Um, and, 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 and welcome those. Um, so to that point, there's actually, I mean, Matt's not kidding when he says that pretty much the whole book gets shared with the company. The amount of redaction that happens, in my experience in comparing them, is often five lines, like individual sentences crossed out. Sometimes maybe one one page or two page attachment that's around like I said, compensation or something specific, but or it's a really a legal item. Or a legal, yeah, but it's really pretty much the whole thing. And what was most interesting for me to see with that was um, going through it, where first, as my company was being acquired, which happened to happen right at the end of the year, um, around the uh, you know the end of the year board meeting and other things like that, and I was privy to some of the board book and the other components and saw that my deal was being discussed in the board book with everybody. And then uh, about a year later, I helped to run an acquisition for the company to acquire another one. And then through that, went through a similar process. And I was actually, that was one of the places where I think I was a little surprised, where I'm all for transparency, but if I, by my instinct, I probably wouldn't have talked about the acquisition to 300 people, because I think of that as like kind of a closed door kind of thing. Um, and uh, so I'm curious you know, if you could comment on that and, and kind of where you draw the line. What, what's OK to share with everybody, what's not? Because I think your line's a little further than most people would think. Yeah, you know, on the M&A stuff, I think it's really, it, in both of those cases, it was a judgment call about likelihood to close. And I think in both cases, based on the timing of the board meeting and the timing of the deals, we were kind of done. Like, we were post-signed term sheet and, you know, halfway done with legal documentation. Diligence was basically finished. 
um, which is you know probably why why I felt comfortable with it. Um, you know, as you said, things about compensation, things that are memos from lawyers about you know ongoing matters, we might pull out. I would say the the biggest thing that I have pulled out um, over time is uh, if I really have uh, one of those think pieces at the end of the book, um, that is uh, that is me really just brainstorming and trying to chew through an issue very early on in the process um, where I want to get the board's guidance on it, but I really don't know what direction it's going to take yet. Um, I have pulled out whole memos about that because um, you know I'm all for transparency, but I don't need all 400 people to know everything that's going on in my head. Um, and you know there's a likelihood of that sending people off in different directions unintentionally. Um, so I have done that a couple of times, although usually when I do that, I tell people that, um, and I'll, you know, I'll note that item X was redacted because it's just not ready for public consumption yet. Um, so there's even some transparency around what is, what is pulled out sometimes. Yeah. From a selling the company perspective, which I've now been through a small number of times, um, you know, my perspective going into it was always, I didn't want to, I, 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 I in general ran it very transparently, but I didn't want to tell any of the team about Mm. As, it, it, I didn't want to tell it as few, I wanted to tell as few people about it as possible until I was sure it was definite because I was just very worried that everybody would be distracted and that they would be wondering what was going to happen to their job and having I mean, questions I didn't have answers for and then what if it didn't happen and all those other things but it was it was interesting to see those trade offs. Um, so we, we have time for probably one or two more questions with us and then we're going to open it up to everybody else. You know, in particular, my my world is all startup world and even when you say startup, you can mean a lot of different things, Matt in many ways still thinks of Return Path as a startup, which has 400 employees and, as you said, running on $100 million in revenue. Um, I think of a startup as like three people at a whiteboard, you know, <laughs> uh, with, with a big bag, bag, of, bag of Cheetos and a box of Pop-Tarts. And, um, and uh, so our discussion, a lot of this has been about early stage boards. I know many of you are involved in public companies and larger boards and larger companies. Can you talk about what, what, what do you, and, and Matt, you've sat you know, you've been obviously very active in your own board, but you sit on other boards as well. You're on the board of the Direct Marketing Association. Um, what's the difference between being on a startup board versus a larger board or a public company board? You know, I think, um, I think there are too many differences, actually. And, um, you know, I, I think with, look, with public company boards, there are obviously um, a whole new set of issues that the board has to uh, tackle and engage in. And those are real and they're very important. Um, but I think the, uh, you know, I think the role of a board at the end of the day is not just about governance. I think governance is important, you've got to get it right. Um, it's also about being a good strategic partner to the business and to the CEO and to the management team. And you know, we, we, as I said, have really tried to run our board over the years as an extension of the management team. Uh, and um, you know, we try hard to get Hmm. <laughs> we try hard to follow driving directions whenever possible. <laughs> uh, we've, uh, you know, we've worked very hard to get the board engaged, engaged in the strategy of the business and the real, the real issues in the business, and to get the board actively and vigorously discussing and debating those things. And um, you know, I, I, the, the larger organizations that I've been uh, involved with um, at the board level, which again haven't been public companies but have been like trade associations or nonprofits, um, tend to be so focused on governance and, and stakeholder issues um, that uh, they, they frequently don't leave the time and the space uh, to talk about the real issues in the business and, um, and quite frankly don't have the culture as a board where it's okay to dig in and talk openly and constructively about what's going on in the business. And every time I've been on one of those boards, I've tried to bring some of the startup board mentality to it um, and uh, you know, tried to create a safe space to, uh, to dig into the issues that are important. And um, I have, I've found frequently that the culture of those boards as institutions are, are just not set up to do that. And you know, the, the, um, I guess the, the, the sort of last thought I'd leave you with if we're going to go to open QA now is I got one you got more one more. So, so I'd say the, the, we, our board has evolved a lot over the years and the way we run it has evolved a lot over the years. And if I had to point to a single uh, sort of turning point in, uh, in which our board went from being 
a, a very good collection of individuals to being a high functioning team. Um, it was uh, the moment that we banned PowerPoint from the boardroom. <laughs> and it sounds like a silly thing, um, and PowerPoint's great, I have no problem with, with PowerPoint as a, as a tool, it has its place and time. But, um, you know, we used to have board meetings where each executive would stand up and present 10 or 15 slides, and um, what we found with that was that, first of all, the entire meeting was focused on looking backwards and reporting, not on discussion. And the second thing we found was that when there are slides on the wall, people look at the wall. When there are not slides on the wall, people look at each other. And it's hard to have a really good conversation when everyone's looking at the wall. But when there's nothing to look at other than the, the eyes of everyone around you, and you're digging into an issue and it's well facilitated by the executive that cares about it, you have a much richer conversation. I think that's a quote for Twitter. Um, well, so I have one last question for you. Let me get to Q&A. Um, so I have one other question for you. So uh, another thing that was new to me in joining the Return Path executive team was the idea of uh, an executive coach. And uh, you know, I'd been involved uh, in, I've had, I've had lots of great mentors. I've had lots of people I've looked up to that have helped me informally over time. But in my experience up till working with Matt, everyone who had ever been paid as a consultant to be a mentor or a coach to me had not worked out very well. I m mostly felt like they weren't qualified to be doing it, like they hadn't, hadn't walked in my shoes, hadn't understood it. Um, and I think I just, in general, wasn't talking to the right people. And um, when I joined the Return Path team, Matt has an executive coach he's been working with for quite a long time and who's actually very involved in the rest of the business. It's not like a psychiatrist that Matt goes and talks, talks to off on a couch somewhere. He comes to the board meetings and he works with the rest of the executive team and he's actually very involved in the board as well. So, um, and, and as it turns out, the board uh, originally is what suggested that Matt get the coach. And there's a little funny story about that too. So Matt, tell us a little bit about how you, you got involved with having an executive coach and what you found useful about it. And then in particular, I'd love if you could talk about why, how do, why, is it a, why does he come to the board meetings and why, how does he interact, interact with the board? I'll start with that one and, and work backwards. So um, the, the guy that Josh is talking about who uh, coaches me, he coaches everyone who reports to me, he coaches us as a team, a leadership team, um, and then occasionally does some other spot project in the company around uh, organization development. Um, you know, I, I find with any consultant or agency that uh, the more you put into the relationship, the more you get out of it. So, um, you know, I, so we make sure that, uh, that this guy, Mark, comes to uh, not every board meeting, but the ones that are in New York. Um, he comes to our executive team off-sites, if not the whole time, then at least part of it, uh, so that he has uh, just a really good feel for what's going on in the business and also gets to see um, see us interact with each other and see how we respond to each other. So coaching in isolation, if all he did was talk to me in my office and Josh in his office, it would be very hard for him to get a, a real feel for the kind of the texture of the conversation and, and the business. So that's why we, we engage him as much as we do. And um, you know, what I've found over the years is that uh, for, for me in particular, the role of CEO is like no other role. Um, you don't have a peer group inside the company, inside the system. And even if you're at a, uh, a startup where you've got co-founders and you know, maybe they're friends or people that you've worked with forever, uh, there's still some really distinct aspects uh, to the job and uh, things that are uh, just very hard to get outside perspective on when you spend all of your time inside the company or even if you spend a bunch of time with your customers. Uh, so uh, for me, having, uh, having a coach, having someone outside the system who can come in and periodically um, talk to me about what's going on inside the system has been very helpful. Uh, the same way that having um, a CEO forum or peer group um, has, been, uh, has been very valuable to me, the same way having a board is very valuable to me. So in some ways I actually think of my coach this, the same way I think of the board. You know, there are people who are one foot in and one foot out and can therefore be, uh, be very uh, uh, helpful uh, to me as advisors. Great. Your phone just buzzed, I just quoted it on Twitter. Um, okay, cool. So we have some questions from the audience. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of tools. I, I'm a, as you know, where I'm always, where Return Path also is 
I got a culture of you know trying new things and trying to be on the latest tools and, and such. And we had many executive debates about me saying that we should use Yammer versus uh, Chatter versus some other tool. Um, quite a question here. Do you use any of the board information apps like Diligent is the example that they use here. But I think what they're referring to is you know, information systems or other things to help manage your board communications and process. No, we, we have not done that. Um, I, uh, I looked a couple of years ago at, um, uh, at apps that would help me publish the board book or publish it um, you know, into an iOS app or an Android app, and I just found that it was, it was just too heavy for, for what it was. That particular one I'm not familiar with. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that, you know, I would say that's the kind of thing that we would at least look at and figure out whether it was going to be um, helpful for us or not. I've seen quite a few um, different tools coming out in the market, particularly focused on investor communications, right. um, both on both sides of it, helping the entrepreneur or the CEO communicate to investors, as right. well as help, helping investors manage a portfolio of investments and, and roll up reporting. And most of them have not been that compelling to me. The most interesting developments recently that I've found have been things that specifically focus on managing electronic um, share certificates mm. and electronic stock option grants. Right. And managing, when it started, now that's getting more interesting to me now, because that's yeah. a big mess of stuff that I yeah, never I you know, took. By, I, get, I get to the next financing, I'm like, oh crap, I gotta go sort all these other things out. Um, and, uh, and so that's been, as that's coming into it, that, that looks more interesting to me. There's a company called eShares that I've been looking at recently um, that, that's kind of in that space, where one of my startups sent me a stock certificate, and it was just an email, and it was like a DocuSign. It was awesome. Um, so maybe that's where it gets more promising. Yeah, no, I'd look at that. Well, I also think you know, for, for a public company where you have specific reporting requirements and structures that you have to meet, I could see that stuff, um, tools like that being, being very impactful. Yeah. So the next two, uh, two questions that are fairly related here. Um, so one of them is, uh, how do you incentivize or compensate your board? And the next one is, how do you evaluate them? So, uh, you know, board compensation for private companies, um, uh, I think, tends to be a little different than public companies. There are some private companies that, uh, that do cash compensation for outside directors. I am not a believer in that at all. Um, I certainly think for, so management directors, it should go without saying there's no compensation for being on the board. Um, venture investors who have significant equity stakes in the business, I am completely allergic to uh, paying them director's fees. I know there are some firms, in particular PE firms, who insist on that as part of their deal terms, and I think that's, quite frankly, a little bit revolting. Um, I mean, your job as a PE guy is to manage the portfolio. And in, in the book, there's a great section on this, and you say, uh, you say, if you have a board member that requests additional compensation, push back. If they insist, find another board member. <laughs> Uh, but even for independent directors, uh, you know, the, the, the job of being on a public company board is much more of a job than being on a private company board. I know how many hours I take of my board members every year, and um, I also know how much my um, equity is worth and how much it's appreciating. And uh, uh, so I you know, firmly believe for private company boards it's all about stock options. And um, you know, my, my rules of thumb around those are uh, that they should vest. Uh, they should vest over the term of the, uh, the directorship, however your governance is set up around that. Uh, I also believe that director shares should um, automatically vest on a change of control because directors obviously don't have an ongoing interest in a private company after that. Um, and the, the rule of thumb that I have around sort of how much equity to give a director is uh, that at whatever point in the life cycle, uh, company's life cycle, you, you hire the director, you should uh, give them about half the equity that you would give a new member of your senior management team. Uh, so if you're giving, uh, you know, if you're giving a, a, a new C-level executive a point of equity, uh, and you're fairly early on in your company's life, you should be giving a director about half a point. The second question was about board feedback evaluation. Uh, or, I think it was, I think it was a little bit stronger than feedback. But yeah, how do you kind of manage your board, evaluate them, um, you know, maybe even deal with one that's not work, not living up to speed. So, um, y you know, we we. I would say used to do this very informally, and um, about two, two or two and a half years ago, I went to uh, a, a two-day course at Stanford Law School at the Rock Center for Corporate Governance for uh, Corporate Directors, and um, I heard, um, uh, gosh, I'm drawing a blank, uh, Bill Campbell, the uh, chairman of Intuit, um, speak a little bit about how he evaluates uh, boards, and um, you know, he said he had a, a formal process for doing it. 
And we at Return Path, we've always had been very rigorous about feedback to the to the team. We do 360 reviews, um, you know, very very uh, sort of deliberate process about that. And I realized actually that we had never done that for the board. Um, so I instituted that at the board. I emailed Bill, and I got from him what was a, a, a an enormous uh, template for board feedback, uh, maybe more appropriate to a large public company. So I sort of picked and chose what I wanted out of it. Um, and we now do board 360s um, every uh, year and a half or so, where each member of the board uh, fills out the same evaluation. And some of it is about the board as a unit, and some of it is about the management team. But then um, I give each of the directors an opportunity to uh, evaluate each of the other directors anonymously. And then we aggregate the feedback and share it back with the board. Um, and uh, the couple of times we've done that, we've always had something interesting come out of it. Um, one of the things to, to get to one of your uh, other questions there, I wish we had done this uh, 10 years ago because 10 years ago I had a very problematic director. Um, I had a director who um, was really, not only was he not adding value, but he was becoming a real distraction uh, for the board and a distraction for the management team. And you know, he'd, he'd come to board meetings and sit there and do email the whole time and you know, take phone calls and uh, was not, not really engaged. Um, and, uh, and he was actually uh, one of our uh, venture investors. And at the end of the day, we removed him from the board, uh, but it was, uh, you know, it was a little challenging to do that. We replaced him with someone else from his, uh, from his firm. Um, and it, what, what that required was uh, a group of three of us going to his senior partner and talking about the issues uh, and, um, and sort of putting some pressure on that way. Um, I think if we had had the more formal board evaluation process in place, that data would have surfaced in um, a much more dispassionate way. And we might have been able to correct it by showing that to the board and everyone would have seen that, um, you know, that this one person was a problem. Or at least we would have had the data to be a little more objective about it than the way it ended up working. It's funny when you talk about planning these evaluations every year and a half. I, and I remember every time, the few times we've talked about something that had more than a year timeline, like some of the 360s mm -hmm. that happen every 18 months. I think that's actually might be a good definition of some of the barrier, the, the, the line between startup and not startup. If, if you can plan something more than a year from now, because <laughs> th there's nothing I put on a more than annual schedule in my, in my world. Um, great. So I think we have some questions from the audience out there. Maybe? It's not on. There it there is. There you go. Please Hi. introduce yourself, too. Um, I'm Sarah Favor Davis. Um, I'm a, on the board of a publicly traded GSE, so I, and, but I come out of the startup world, so I really appreciate your comment about how good it would be to get some startup uh, energy into some of these, these public company boards. Um, I also was really interested in your perspective on bringing in outside directors on, on startup boards. And relative to that, how important is governance skill and expertise relative to industry? If you're bringing in somebody from outside, do you hold out until you find somebody who has both, even if it means not having an outside person for a while? Or do you have, is it OK to have a really good governance person with the right philosophy and right skills, even if they're not industry specific? You know, I, I, would, I would add a third dimension to it. Um, because again, governance for closely held private comp companies is not typically a, a significant issue. Um, but for me, the, the type of independent director that I want on the board is, um, uh, is typically a CEO. So I want someone who has sat in my chair and who understands the issues that I face around <laughs> running and building uh, the organization and around strategy. So. I've found that it is helpful to have people connected to the industry in, in one way or another, and I've, I don't think I've ever had an independent director that wasn't. Um, but I would, uh, I would certainly consider one uh, if I felt that they could give me and the management team you know, sort of very good high-level strategic advice about building and scaling a company. Yeah, I know um, I've, uh, when I think about the stage, I think to me it's really about the stage of the company. And at most of the boards I'm involved in, which are early stage companies, kind of up, up to kind of series A, series B, um, it's all about industry 
experience. It's actually There's all about product early on. Product, right? and, but, but, but it's what I'm looking for a board member. It's, it's generally like, how are they connected to what we're doing? How are they gonna bring in relationships, experience, connections? It's absolutely nothing to do with board governance, because board governance on a private small board is so simplistic. Um, and you, you, know, you really just have to, you generally have one other stakeholder or one other investor that, you know, and you're both sitting there talking about it. Um, and then certainly as the company gets larger, as you have more investors to take, care, care, uh, take into account, as you start to think about going public, then those other issues, suddenly, then it's like, crap, we need to get somebody on here that knows something about how to run a board. <laughs> like, um, and and it you know, starts to be more of that. Uh, so we have, I, I have a, a lap full of questions. Um, so we're gonna try to get, get to as many of them as we can. Um, so can you talk about um, the compos and this actually even relates to maybe that last question, how the composition of the board has changed over time, and both in, and I know in the book you talk about the size of the board changing right. as well as the types of people. Yeah, we're, um, we're at seven directors now. Um, most of the company's life we've had uh, five or six. Um, it is, by the way, uh, there's some states where you can't have an even number by law, but having an even number is not a bad thing. As I always say, if, we had a, if, if it all came down to a 3-3 tie all the time, we'd have much bigger problems to worry about. Um, but in the early years of the board, we, we really just had three people. Um, and uh, for us, the, the relative composition has was always... Was that you, you, Brad, and Fred? No, no. It was actually before, before we took venture money, it was me and two independents. Okay. Um, and, then, um, and then we added the venture guys to the mix. So our board has always been only one person from management. I'm actually a big believer in only having one person from management on the board. Um, and you know, for a couple of reasons, uh, I think it creates a strange dynamic to have sort of multiple founders on a board. Um, and uh, I also think you know, having you only have a limited number of slots where you can bring in people from the outside, and why would you fill them with someone who, who's there all day, every day, uh, anyway? Uh, but we've always had all three. We've always had um, me as management, a couple of investors, and a couple of independents. I think the typical arc of a board for a startup is that it's you know only management, and then it's only management and investors, and then at some point someone says, we've got to get an independent on, on the board here. The other place I find it come into play is uh, you know, for, uh, as you bring on investors, sometimes you'll want an independent to balance that out. Yeah. That, okay, we're bringing on our first investor. We don't want it to, both, we don't want a two-person board, and also, you know, I want somebody else who's involved who isn't part of the company, but is in some ways, as a founder, I want somebody that's gonna have my back, that's like, I think of as my vote as well, um, you know, versus the investor. Um, and so the next follow-up question, would do you ask board members to invest in the company? Is that ever a criteria? So I mean, obviously, investors become board members quite frequently, but right. does it work the other way around? Hey, you want to be on the board, why don't you buy into the company? Um, I, uh, I'm delighted when they want to, I never require it. Um, you know, I'm giving them equity that vests over time for their service, and it's great when they want to do it. So probably, probably about half of our independent uh, directors over time have uh, invested, and. Uh, and half haven't, and that's okay. I, I, I actually don't even think about that as a, um, as, as a requirement. Yeah, I think that's probably also a stage-related thing. At very early stage companies that are, you know, before they have an institutional investor, I would say it's very, very common that you would expect the someone you're bringing on the board to be an investor as well. Um, and often it might be, you know, your lead angel investor or something like that, right. unless it's gonna be that case where they have really specific industry experience. Cam, did you have a question? Okay. Uh, my name is Cam Hauser, and I run a company called Three Day Startup. First off, I'd like to say thanks to both of you for sharing this with us. Uh, one question I had was, in terms of what your board members actually do, um, is this something that, in the best case scenario, you've mapped this out very clearly as an understanding beforehand? Because kind of like Josh is saying, my experience is with planning a year out is impossible, and uh, you know you need to be going where the puck is, and, uh, where the puck's heading instead of where it is. So just some. Um, some kind of broad brushstrokes on how do you, what's acceptable to ask of them? How do you establish the relationship of what you can expect of them versus what you want them to do versus what they want to do? And uh, when are you crossing a line and getting yourself in trouble such that they might be doing some task that's great and really core, but that's what a full-time employee should be doing because right. they can't be fully devoted? Yeah, I mean, I, we, I, I think the best kind of board I describe as strategically engaged and operationally distant. And um, you know, as I said, the, the process of hiring a board member I take as seriously as the process of hiring an executive. Um, we do have a job description. We do lay out what we expect um, of directors, and we just set those expectations up front. And, and that's how we run it, and then that's how we evaluate everyone's performance on the back end. Um, the, uh, 
you know, there's, there's a baseline of expectations, which is you're going to show up for all the meetings unless something extraordinary is happening in your life. Um, and you're going to show up having done your homework. Um, and you know, I think beyond that, um, what I've found with, with board members is that um, you know, we, we've built a board uh, with different people that have complementary experience sets and complementary skills. And we want to take advantage of those things as we need to take advantage of those things. So um, I've, I've never had outside of the four board meetings per year and whatever committee meetings are associated with compensation or audit, um, I've never had a structure where I'm expecting board members to do something regularly. Um, but I do expect that when I or someone on my management team calls them with a question or asks them if they would spend a few hours with us doing a deep dive on something, that they will make themselves available to do that as best they can. So um, I, you know, I think we're very specific around the behavior and time commitment in and around meetings, including preparing for them. Um, and outside of that, um, there is an expectation that they will um, keep their eyes and ears open on the outside and tell us things that they hear that they think we need to know, but more just that they'll be responsive as we need them to do specific deep dives on things. Uh, but we've, we've never really had a board member that sort of you know, does something every day, week, month that has the flavor of operational to it. It's funny, as you said, I like the quote, uh, strategically engaged but operationally distant. Uh, I've got a five-year-old little girl, and so the song going through my head all the time right now is that song from Frozen, um, which I'm sure you all know. And there's a, there's a quote in there that says, uh, all problems look small from a distance. <laughs> and I think that's you know, part of being operationally distant, gives you a good perspective on that. Um, so here's another a good one I know you cover in the book as well um, and, uh, and might easily be confused. I, I happen to know Cam pretty well and I wouldn't be, I, I, my, my guess is that his board probably falls more into this role. Um, what's the difference between an advisory board and a, a board board? Um, you know, there's, there's obviously an important legal distinction, right? The board of directors, um, you know, has governance and fiduciary responsibility. Um, you know, I think of, um, I've never had an advisory board because I've always used my board as a strategically engaged advisory board. Um, I have had advisors, and um, you know, when I think about advisors, actually, you know, Josh was an advisor to Return Path before we acquired his company, and um, I had given him a small option grant, and you know, expected that he would. Uh, answer questions periodically or talk to me periodically or keep his eyes and ears open for the company. In the book you talk about having almost like a little army of fans out there. Yeah, that yeah exactly. We, call, we, in, we yeah. call them unemployees. Okay, you said that sometimes yeah. it's better if they don't have any stock options right. even, right? Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, for, for me, having an, uh, an advisory board, I think if you, companies that have advisory boards need to run them like boards to get something out of them. Like if you want to create that thing as a group, then you have to run it like a group. You have to create a team dynamic. You have to get those people engaged with each other. Um, and uh, you know, companies can certainly, can certainly do that. But I'd say um, you know, at some point, you should be thinking about how you're actually sculpting a, your board board for that purpose. Yeah, in my experience, particularly on and this again being on the earlier side of things, I see very these days I see very few formal advisory boards where the where it, when, and I would say that one of the bigger distinctions that ends up happening is that an advisory board uh, generally is dealt with individually, where the CEO or other members of the team are interacting with the individual member of the advisory board, getting advice, bringing them in to engage on specific topics, things like that, and whereas a board of directors really functions as a team and as a unit. Uh, in, you know, and, and, and then other has other fiduciary responsibilities as well. Yeah, and I think that's probably more true for startups than more mature businesses. You know, a startup is on a is just on a, a, a very different trajectory than a more mature business. And hopefully, the, hopefully, right. Yeah. And the, the person that you need to advise you on some of those things one month might be different from the person you need to advise you six months later or three months later. Um, where uh, you know, having a board of directors is about consistency. And, uh, and, and stability and governance in addition to strategic advice. Well, we are coming up on 9 o'clock, so we just have time for a few more questions here. Um, any more in the audience for the microphone? So uh, I've got two more here. Uh, any, any significant difference on a board that's pre-revenue? Is, that is that an inflection point in any way? Does the board change? 
I don't, I don't think so. I mean, it's certainly it's, the reporting is different, right? When you have yeah. revenue, there's a little bit more stuff to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, that's right. Well, you still have financials. You just yeah. they start with <laughs> they zero. Just, they just only <laughs> spend money. Um, I don't know. I mean, look, pre-revenue and post-revenue is certainly a big inflection point for for a company. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily an inflection point for the board. I mean, you're still managing a balance sheet. You're still managing the growth of the business, even if the growth is measured in users as opposed to, to dollars. Yeah. I'd say, you know, certainly there's a lot of board members who once you start to have that, now they can use more, maybe there's more pattern matching. And you talk about pattern matching a lot in the, yeah. as a value of the board member. Uh, some of the value I've found from certain board members who are certainly part of the, part of the reason I've probably seen this value is because they compliment me, it's not my strength, is particularly kind of financial pattern matching, right. right? They just, they look at the balance sheet and they go, this percentage is off. I don't know what's wrong with the business, but I can tell you that number, that is, number wrong is wrong because yeah. I've seen lots of other businesses and that's not right. That's yeah. too high. You shouldn't be spending that much money on that. Right. Um, and I find that kind of interesting and some of that doesn't really come into play. Well, I guess I was talking about spending, but right. a lot of that doesn't come into play. Yeah, you you're always spending. Get really so. yeah. uh, and then I guess uh, the last question I have here, um, what resources or advice, would, and I, want, I might need some help with making sure I understand this one, but um, what resources or advice would you recommend for a small executive team or small owner to use to transfer the company goodwill and executive leadership in the kind of getting ready for a sale. Um, and maybe, you know, I know in the book you also talk about um, what the board's role is in a sale as well and why some of their compensation and vesting is different because of that. So that might, might play in as well. So, sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure I 100% get the does question. Does the person who asked this want to give us a little help on direction? Uh, if you've got a company that um, was started by a sole entrepreneur and grew to, you know, fairly large size and they're trying to uh, cash out and sale, um, the, the image, the goodwill of the company and all of the, the branding and everything else that's associated with that founder um, needs to be transferred to someone else if that founder is not going to be there in the future. And so, you know, are there resources or advice that we would give to um, a company in that situation where they could transfer, you know, the brand to the, the, the people that were going to be there after the sale? Yeah, so that's something I've actually probably had a lot of personal experience with a few times now. Um, and you know, certainly with my, when I sold the company to Matt, I was, my, my personal brand was very much tied up yeah. in the company as well. These days I wear a Capital Factory t-shirt every day, but for about four years I wore another inbox shirt every day. Um, and, and by the way, people in the industry kept coming up to me after the deal and saying, oh, I heard you acquired Josh. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually we acquired other inbox. Right. We, um, <laughs> so I think, um, you know, I think that, that ends up being really different in a lot of companies. Um, sometimes you go into a, a situation like that and you know very well that the founder is not staying and they make that very clear up front and it's like, I got a six month window, we're transferring all the paperwork, we're, you know, I'm gonna help button things up and I'm out of here. Um, I've never gone through an experience like that. I've always um, felt like one, in order to maximize the value of the opportunity as well as to take good care of the company, I mean, generally whatever company I was selling, I cared a lot about it. My brand was tied up into it. I didn't wanna just throw it over the edge and be like, okay, I'm done, you know, now it's yours. I, I wanted to make sure that, that that went really smoothly and that that both took care of my employees and my customers and the product and then the bigger vision of what we were trying to do together. And so for me, it's always been important that it wasn't like that, that, that we were all on the same page and I was part of that story and that, um, and that you know, and, that, and that's why it was important to me to join the executive team, to be, be able, you know, I wasn't a board member, but I had lots of board visibility and was able to interact with the board quite a bit um, and was able to really personally put myself behind it. Um, I even got my, I think the first thing I did was ordered a pair of red, uh, red return pass shoes. Um, <laughs> that, uh, that was, um, anyway, uh, but um, so, uh, so I think it's a lot about how the founder handles that, you know, and, and, and them kind of Continuing to personally put themselves behind it. I don't know if you have. Well, I think they're. I think they're. You know, talking about selling a company or or a, you know a, a founder and majority owner cashing out. I think there's just lots of different models for it depending on who the who the acquirer is. So selling to a private equity firm, where your company is still a completely standalone entity, but you're not there anymore, or you might not be there anymore, is really different from selling to. Um, you know, a, a financial buyer or a, or a strategic buyer that wants to leave your business generally intact and maybe integrate some back office, which is very different from selling to a company that wants to take your product and rip your organization apart. 
And um, you know, I've seen CEOs go through all three of those things, and I think they behave very differently in all three circumstances, uh, depending on on what their role is going to be going forward. Yeah, I think also to that point, kind of, you know, a lot of, especially on the earlier stage of acquisitions, the company is there's often two stages, and either it's the product is being acquired and the team because that's going to fit into this bigger strategy, and you want to see that product enhanced and grow and be part of the bigger tool set, which is kind of similar to how the other inbox acquisition happened with return path. Um, and other times, uh, it's, but we didn't have a lot of significant revenues to, to stand for or anything like that at the time we were acquired. It was really, we had a, a product that could plug into their business that return path knew they could make a lot more money off of very quickly. And so it fit really well to do that. But they weren't buying, they weren't really buying a business. There wasn't a significant customer base behind, we had millions of users but we didn't have millions of people paying us. Um, and, uh, and so in other cases, you're buying a balance sheet. It's much more like, okay, I'm getting this list of customers. I've got this kind of revenue that's coming in. I'm gonna, I may switch them over to my product. I may, it's much more of a business line. And I think that's part of the maturity of the company as well, when you can get past the point that the company value is not the founder <laughs> and not you know, just the, or the, the vision, but it's also you know, it's, it's the real business. And I think you know, that's a, a maturity issue as well. Well, good. I think that's just about our time. Do you have any last comments, Matt, or anything else you want to share? Uh, you know, I guess the the the, um, the only other thing that I would say is I think uh, large companies have a lot to learn from startups, and I think startups have a lot to learn from large companies. And I, um, you know, I think the the two worlds used to be very, very, very separate, and and um, I think they're increasingly converging, and I think that's a pretty healthy thing for the ecosystem. Great. Well, thanks, Matt. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>